Welcome to the fourth episode of Raising Rebecca Books, The Birth of a Publishing House. This is the audio story of me, Rebecca Seitz, building a traditional, royalty-paying publishing house from the ground up, told to you as it unfolds. Last week, I shared that we have a new acquisitions editor here at Rebecca Books. I am so excited that this week, you get to hear directly from E. Danielle Butler yourself. We hit record on a conversation that I invite you to listen to now. You're listening to Raising Rebecca Books, The Birth of a Publishing House on the 1C Story Network. 1C is made possible in part by the support of the following sponsor. start with, um, let's see, where do I want to start? I actually did give this thought. I was professional about it and everything. Um, I'd like to start with when you first knew that you loved books. When did you first fall in love with books? Ah, that's such a wonderful question. The vivid memory, I think I'm about four. I had to be four because I was in pre-K was marching in like pre-K and kindergarten over to the fourth and fifth grade halls in elementary school to read books to them. Now, looking back, I'm like, was that a ploy to get me to be a better reader? (laughs) What what was the purpose behind that? But that's when I knew going over there, like with a select group of students to sit down and just read to these big kids, right? Because they're so much bigger. I knew then for like, that's the memory like that's knowing. And what were your books of childhood, the ones you loved that you remember? Oh man, that Dr. Seuss Go Dogs Go mm. had me in a <laughs> chokehold. <laughs> I was in a chokehold over that book. Um, and then my grandmother, uh, I spent a lot of time with her and she had this devotional. I own it now. She was a nurse and it's called On Call. And mm. I was fascinated with that book too. That was my grown-up book. Your yeah. grown-up book. That's my grown-up <laughs> book was on call. Devotional. Now you experiences. you write as well. So when did you know that you had this ability to write that maybe not every human does? So I began writing probably around that same time. I I found recently some of my squabbles that my mother had saved, but I don't know that I didn't know that it wasn't something that everybody could do. I didn't know that until much later. I thought that we were all making up fantastic stories and sharing them with the world. Me too. Me too. I have to tell you. So first time I ever made real money for my writing, um, my brother-in-law had deployed to Iraq and I wrote a piece about the day he deployed, just sort of documenting it for the family. And then um, Multnomah, which is now Waterbrook Multnomah, was doing a book called Stories from a Soldier's Heart. And it was an anthology. And so I submitted it and they accepted it. And a few months later I got a check and it wasn't, it was like $300 maybe or $600. It was a few hundred dollars. But I remember I was living in a condo in Nashville at the time. And I had a roommate because I couldn't afford a place on my own. And I had gotten the mail and I stopped underneath the uh, Bradford pear tree in the front yard to open my mail. Cause there was this check from Multnomah yeah. or there was this envelope from Multnomah. And I was like, I wonder what this is. If it's an update on the book, when the book's coming out and I opened it and there was a check and I held this check in my hands and I stared at it. And I said, this is actual money because yes. I put words on a screen that makes no sense to me. <laughs> so that's probably when it kicked in, right? That it wasn't for everybody it was probably the first time that I like earned something for it. It was like, Oh, okay. Well, that, All right. there's that. That's a thing. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah. I just thought, why is everybody not doing this? And then it, it had to be explained to me. Well, everyone doesn't have the ability to just sit down and put words on a screen. And I thought, really? Like, are you sure? <laughs> I yes. feel like everybody can do this. <laughs> That's a truth that I am sitting with over the last probably 10 to 15 years that it's not an everybody got that gift thing. Mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. That's a new truth for me. Cause I truly believed like, of course you can. Of course you can. (laughs) Who can't? And now I'm like, ah, 
I, I see. I see. Now you look at some of this stuff of coming through of people who want to be published and you're like, I see, I see. I see Not I everyone see. can do Not that. Not everyone can write. It is a gift. And so now I, I try to honor that gift, recognizing that it's not freely and widely given for sure. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. So here at Rebecca Books, I have explained in previous episodes to the audience that we are only publishing romance and business written by and about women 40 and over. But I I'd love for you to talk about what exactly draws your attention or what you appreciate, whether that's about content or the way the content is brought to you. We are very clear on the website about what needs to be in your proposal. Yes. But what exactly are you paying attention to when those proposals come in now that they are all landing on your desk, not mine? <laughs> ha, ha, ha. You say that with such joy, right? <laughs> joy under there. For those of you listening, you can't see Rebecca's face, but I can. And <laughs> like her cheeks are rosy and she is joyful as she says that. Very okay? joyful. Um, so what am I looking for? Number one, um, I think the first test is, did you follow directions? Because on our website, mm. everything is super clear. This is what we need to see. Um, these are the things that need to be in your proposal. So that's number one. Like, because so many are coming in, it's like, okay, who can follow the directions? That's an easy bar. Um, the second thing I look for is a voice that I haven't heard or seen before, but that sounds so realistic. Mm, mm -hmm. That is what I love. I love when someone can bring me into a story that I can see as being real, even if it's totally imagined. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to fiction writing, like I want to believe that this could be if you're telling me that purple aliens are coming down and falling in love, you know, with <laughs> humans, I want it to be believable. I want this purple alien to fall in love with this woman who is over 40, which means, you know, that her body's going to look a little bit different mm -hmm. than a teeny bopper or, or someone in their earlier years. Um, I'm also looking for works that unfold, um, that give us some layers, because I think that by the time we are women, we have experienced so many things from girlhood to teenagehood to young adulthood, that by the time we hit this stage, I think 40 is like womanhood. I think by the time we've mm. hit that, mm -hmm. um, there are just some nuances and some layers that I think appear as a result of our experiences and our existences. I like to see those layers. So let's talk about that a little bit, because whenever I'm talking to anybody about Rebecca Books and I say we want writers who are women 40 and over writing about women 40 and over, they ask, well, what's the difference in a romance featuring a heroine who's 45 versus 25 or 35. What's the big difference? What's the big deal? And I've explained it a million times, but I feel like maybe it would be good to have another explanation too, of what would you expect to see in those stories that you don't necessarily see in what is right now looks to be 90 to 95% of romance out there, which is heroines in their twenties and thirties. So the first part is that it exists, right? Like the first mm. thing is it, acknowledging that romance exists at 40 and over. And I don't know about you, but I remember being in my 20s and feeling like the 40s were so far apart or away mm -hmm. that I could barely wrap my mind around it, let alone this idea of being in love and loved. Um, so when I think about a heroine that is 40, I think she knows some things about herself that may cause her to make choices differently than one who's 20 or 25. Mm. Um, she may approach this romance in a totally different way. So I'm, I'm thinking about those things. She's bringing these life experiences with her. Um, and she's adding that into her selection process, right? Love over 40 is definitely a choice. It is a choice oh, yeah. to allow <laughs> yourself to be loved to know what it is that romance feels like to you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a dear friend, I'm gonna use this example of romance because I, I feel like this shows up in that. I have this dear friend and we were talking recently and her husband brought her a snack and a drink and she looked at him and she's like, you are the best, right? <laughs> like, I think you're so amazing. Mm. That ro that's romance, right? Because he mm -hmm. spoke her language 
in that moment that was romantic to her versus someone that doesn't necessarily have as much experience. So she may be saying, oh, I want the roses and, and, and the quilt and the balloons and the teddy bears and all of those mm. things. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But over 40, at 40 and over 40, you know that you can bring me the flowers. But if that flower comes with something cold to drink or something yeah. my warm <laughs> favorite, Okay, you're going to get a little bit further in this experience. <laughs> There's um, one of my favorites. There's some, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about. I love Jennifer Cruzy and I study her novels. Yeah. And um, I can't I, I cannot tell you which title it is, but she she does often point out that red roses just don't just don't. It's better for you to not send anything if you're going to send red roses unless I have told you yes. that I love red roses. And then, yes, absolutely. But otherwise, it feels so um, unspecific, nonspecific to mm -hmm. the heroine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in our forties, we tend to not put up with that as much in our forties. We're like, if you're not going to see me, if I'm just going to be a woman and not the woman that I am, yes. then never mind. You know, it's, yes. I need this to be real. I see you and you see me as opposed to it feels, it even felt for me. I mean, my husband was my 13th marriage proposal. And that wow. part of that was because where I'm from, what the girls do, I'm from a rural town in Tennessee. And, and so at growing up at that time, I'm Gen X, the purpose was to get married and have kids yes. and build a home. And that's what you did as a female. And so I wasn't alone in having all of those marriage proposals. There's nothing special about me, but it was, it all felt very, um, systematic yes. instead of specific. Mm -hmm. And so in this phase of life, it, it, I think there has to be much more specificity in seeing each other also because at this age, a woman knows herself, like what you yes. were talking about. We've taken the time to know who we are and what flowers we like and yes. what ways of being, what snacks we like. Exactly. Like <laughs> exactly. No, I'm, I feel that same way. Right. I think we are learning ourselves. We are meeting ourselves. We're understanding ourselves for so much of our lives that when we hit like this, this golden era, right? Mm -hmm. We are headed towards the golden days of life. It is because we may not know all of the things that we like, but we've lived enough to know what we definitely don't like mm -hmm. and to be able to put words and articulation to that. And we love differently as a result. And we receive love differently as a mm -hmm. result. Um, I see a lot online of women saying at this age, the bar is much higher mm -hmm. for me to allow you entry into my life because if it's harder, if my life is harder because you're in it, then never mind. Don't need you. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. even need you. Like I've had enough life lessons, right? complications <laughs> and such without you adding to that. Right. And I think that is what we want to see at Rebecca books in those heroines that are choosing to love and be loved. Like that's what we want to know. We want to yeah. know what is the choice that they are making? Not, Oh, I bumped into the guy at the coffee shop and he was so hot and, was and I cute, had so. to be with them yeah. because but also, how dare he look at me because I'm just a book nerd writing in the corner. Oh, the yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, I love those <laughs> stories. I really, really do. But I feel like Rebecca Books has a, a, a lot more substance when you talk about that specificity. Specificity? You know what I'm saying. Specificity. Specificity. <laughs> There we go. We got there it. Go. It's a word. It exists, guys. Um, <laughs> when I think about that, I think that's what we're looking for. It's it's yeah. the layers and the nuance in how the romance unfolds. And I'm interested to see the depth of those men that they have to bring to the equation as opposed to, I feel like they're, they can be a little more shallow in, in 20 year old romances, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, like I was saying, if you have to bring something of value to the equation at this age, or we'll just say, never mind. <laughs> Never mind. He, you are handsome, yes, but can you also fix something? Right. <laughs> like, you are handsome, but can you also like what mm -hmm. else? Can you what bring, else do you bring <laughs> uh, with it? You know, I there's there's this uh, underlying conversation about dating in like 2023, 2024 about um, a, a man. Would you date a man with calloused hands or not? Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, because I mean, he's a hard work. worker. <laughs> he's got some 
some work ethic about himself, right? <laughs> I think they too, I mean, obviously I'm not a man, so I don't know the male psyche as well as I know mine, but I think men too are bringing um, different things at 40 and 50 years old into yes. their relationships, whether it's their romantic relationships or their friendships or whatever, yes. they too have been through some things, right? Maybe they've been harmed by women or they've had layoffs and so their psyche is damaged and things like that, that they, I think it provides this opportunity that doesn't exist in romances featuring 20 year olds where when I read romances that feature 20 year olds and you know, I've been reading romance since I was 12. Um, me too. Me too. It's yeah. they're shiny and new yes. <laughs> people. And so the woman often is portrayed as she has things in her background already that have made, made her broken in some way. And he's yes. coming in to heal that. But a 45 year old man also is broken in some ways, yeah. you know, he's got a broken marriage or he's got bad relationship stuff or bad work stuff or bad family stuff or whatever. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm excited to see the layers of both sides and how those layers come together to make some beautiful romance story. I'm, I'm stoked about it. I, I am, however, very glad that they're going to your desk first and not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There are those rosy cheeks again, guys. The crazy eyes and the rosy cheeks as she says it. But I'm super I'm excited happy. too. I'm just so grateful to have you on board because, yeah, it's a lot to wade through, which is awesome. I love that we have a lot to wade through. That's amazing. Yes. Please absolutely keep sending in your keep proposals. Keep sending them. Everybody. This is not us saying don't send them. We want to read them. I have to read something at night. Right. So you might as well send it to me. Well, and we were talking yesterday about how we really need more um Indigenous stories, yes. Um, more Hispanic stories. Mm -hmm. We we really want a wide cultural range of yes, please of the basis for these stories. So um, we're not seeing enough of it. We've got fantastic black stories, fantastic white stories, but mm -hmm. we need more color. I think. Yeah, we need some more texture in these cultures. Come on, mm -hmm. we would love mm -hmm. to hear from you. Um, because I, uh, another thing that I think about when I think about bringing women together, wise women, right, with these mm. words, uh, I think about something you said. You talked about this idea of growing up in a small town and what the expectation was. I think there's a cultural conversation to be had as mm -hmm. well, right? What are other cultures' experiences um, when it comes to building romance? What what are we taught as women in other cultures? Versus what these women at 40 are are facing. How mm -hmm. have they been groomed or kept or whatever? And how are they moving forward and choosing to love and be loved in those spaces? I yes. think that's going to be important. And I, I can't wait to see how those unfold. Yeah. Uh, who is uh, Sonali Dev? I love her romances. They are... Um, Indian based. Hmm. And uh, I, I read one recently that really kind of struck home for me as I thought about like when you've been raised or or groomed in specific cultures with expectations, what does that mean for, hmm. for love later? Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can learn there from each other, right? Yes. Of I know how it's handled in a small Southern town. Mm -hmm. um, I know now how it's handled in a coastal town. Yes. Um, but I don't know there's so much that I don't know from so many other perspectives of if you're a 45 year old Cuban woman in California and you know, you're second generation American or third generation, how, what I'm sure your experience, your romantic experience is coming with cultural ideas that mine would not. And yes. so I would just, Oh, I'd love to see those stories. That would be so. Exciting. Those are the ones bring us your stories, bring yes, us your please. stories. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit because we also are acquiring business books yes. here. And, you know, you and I have talked about, I just feel like when you look at the business space in the bookstore, when you look on the shelves, there are not a lot of words by women in there between 40 and 60, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we own millions of small businesses and medium sized businesses in this nation. And it's frustrating to me because we're having to figure it out on the fly despite the fact that there exists a body of wisdom out there. It's just that the wisdom's not being packaged and brought to us so that we can learn from what the women before us have done. I realize we've only been in the workplace for about five minutes, but <laughs> there is some... well, we've done some incredible things in those. Five right. Minutes, right? Like, <laughs> right. We've changed how business is being done. We have. And I would love to 
be a, a, a place where that wisdom is captured and that history is captured and transmitted so that the rest of us can be learning from what else, what these other women have been doing in their, um, in their careers and in their businesses. So talk to me specifically about what you're looking at when it comes across the desk of what kind of business stories are capturing your attention? Which ones do you think would be valuable to put into that space? Wonderful question. When I think about women in business, <clears throat> over 40. There are so many books, like you said, that are out there for women under 40. You know, I made this under 40 list, this under 30 list, and here's mm -hmm. how I did it. There are certain considerations that come alongside with a, being a working woman of a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that we have to take into consideration that other demographics don't. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for stories that bring those considerations to the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have maternity leave policies in corporate until someone ends mm -hmm. up pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. Like somebody comes and they're pregnant. And it's like, ah, we need a maternity you leave. Figure this out. <laughs> figure this out, right? And so I think that that body of wisdom that you talk about when I'm looking at these, these stories, I want to hear relevant stories with feeling, because we are emotional beings, even when we walk into our corporate offices, we can put on our, our mask of stoicism, but there is feeling that's mm -hmm. that's there um, and the lessons that we learned in those moments. I want to know, as a woman in business, how do I maintain authenticity? I want to learn things about best practices for negotiating and mm -hmm. showing up at the table and going toe to toe with, you know, the good old boys club. I mm -hmm. want to hear not just how to do it, but how to do it well. I want to read those stories that also are honest about what your failures have been. What mm -hmm. are the, the mistakes that you have made that turned into a lesson? What are the oopses that have happened that become opportunities for you? Um, that's what I'm looking for when I read business books from from these women that are, are coming to us, because I want to be able to to encourage the generations that are to come that, number one, your feelings, they matter. They're valid no matter mm -hmm. what they try to tell you. Um, but here's a way that we can deal and that's helpful with those feelings and emotions while still being a credible source in your field, while still being an industry leader. Um, I find it fascinating that in 2024, people are still showing up as the first, right? right? The first woman for this. <clears throat> The first woman of color in this, the first mm -hmm. female leader too, which says that we still have a long way to go. I don't know necessarily that we're the first so much as we're the first documented. And I mm -hmm. want us to be able to document those stories, documenting the journey so that others, A, can learn from them, B, can avoid some of the mistakes, but can also take it, learn it, and add on. We as women are good for that, creating a snowball, right? Mm -hmm. Taking something and making it our own and then growing it to something more. And so I want us to be able to have those stories that people can take, learn, and grow from and with. Mm -hmm. I think for me, there are two um, things that set a woman's business story apart from a man's business story, at least in terms of the stories that I know in yes. terms of the books that I own and the books that I've read. And I was just talking about this yesterday with one of our authors whose books we're publishing. Um, she's a banker and she is a first in her field in yes. so many ways. <clears throat> and we were actually talking yesterday. She was brought into the last bank that she worked for to diversify the staff at that bank. Mm -hmm. And the town that she was brought to was like 90% white. And she was like, I didn't realize it also was being brought to diversify the town. Yes. And that comes with its own challenges too, because now she's got her professional life. But then when she leaves the office, she's still walking into a place where there's not a lot of representation. Yes. So that brought its own challenges, right? And that mm -hmm. it was just a completely different mindset because that's not what she had been living in when she left the location of the bank that she was at, at their behest and came to a new a new location. But for me, anyway, what we were talking about was that uh, women tend to approach their work in a more holistic fashion than a male. Yeah. So like what you're talking about, we have considerations that males don't because we also tend to be the ones running our household and the ones running the children and running all the extracurriculars and all of those mm -hmm. things. And so we have to fit in 
mm-hmm. our careers with the rest of our lives in ways that most males still in the year of our Lord, 2024, <laughs> still do not. Yeah. And so it was getting vulnerable and showing, you know, we're, we're brought into the workplace and we often have male bosses and therefore there is rarely space given for us to be honest out loud about when you ask me to stay late or when you put this extra load on me, this is the impact it's having, not just on me, but on my home. Mm -hmm. We just were kind of taught not, not to talk about that because it's still so new that we're even here and in this workforce. But in these books, I would love to see that vulnerability to see, you know, I had to stay till eight o'clock. And so I missed X, Y, Z. And here is how I handled that in my house. Or I knew that I couldn't miss that in my family. And so here is how I handled the conversation with that coworker or with that supervisor to maintain the balance between work and home. You know, I just, I quit and started my own business. <laughs> That's how I handled yes. it. Yes. And if you did that, is. you know, but, but having lived that myself, that comes with its own challenges too. It takes over your life in the beginning mm-hmm. to get it up and running. So I'm hoping that we can find, um, memoirs and biographies and business books that are that women allow themselves to step out of the corporate space where we're not allowed to talk about that. Yes. And really when they're behind their screens writing these books that they will talk about that that they will because the rest of us can learn how to do it well mm-hmm. or how not to do it. <laughs> if you mm-hmm. tell us yeah, I handled it in this way and and this was the negative impact on me. I feel like we can teach each other and we can help each other handle this better. And then, so, so that vulnerability of how did it impact your home life? Mm -hmm. I I hope, or or the rest of your life, not just your home life, but the rest of your life. I hope that we, we can put in there because I don't see that in male written business books. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, now my ADHD brain is like, what's the other thing you wanted to see the home life? Oh, I would love to see the, the um, holistic aspect of it in terms of we have this one business book that we were looking at from um, a woman who went on a year long intense spiritual journey. Yes. And as she was telling me about this, she was saying, I would love to publish with Rebecca books. I would love to be considered by you guys, but my book is mostly about my spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. And I said, did it not impact your business life? And she said, Oh my gosh, my business life has completely taken off because I went on this journey. And I said, that's a business book, you know, for a woman, I I don't know of men who are writing business books about, I went on an intense spiritual journey and now I'm killing it in my field because I've come into this awareness and come into this connection and that sort of thing. So those sorts of books showing us how something else you did in your journey Mm -hmm impacted negatively or positively your business life. I I feel like that will help us build a library here of business books that authentically show the difference in the experience of a female in the workplace versus a male in the workplace. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. The two words that come up when I hear you describe those things are um, interconnection and intersectionality, right? Because Mm -hmm. we as women, we don't have we don't have the margins to be able to separate all of the things. An example Mm -hmm. that I use all the time is no matter who we are as women, for me, I'm a mom, you're a mom. Mm -hmm. I can be having this, this conversation with you, this talk with you. We can be doing all of the things, crunching numbers. We can be in full on business mode. Mm -hmm. If our phone rings and it's the school calling, Mm -hmm. No matter what business we are doing, our mind automatically goes Mm -hmm. to solving whatever that call is about, right? Mm -hmm. We can silence it. We can send them to voicemail. But the next few minutes of our meeting is, Mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap this up very quickly to make sure everything is okay. That's right. What projects are outstanding in case this is a call that means that I'm not coming back today, Mm -hmm. that I'm not getting to do the next thing. So we don't have the leeway of compartmentalizing all of the parts of our lives. We don't get to walk into the office, put on our office clothes, be an office person, and then Mm -hmm. go back home. And I think that is a distinction that we have to talk about. What is that mental, the gymnastics piece of it that happens? Um, We have to be both and all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, And on our business journeys. And then the second piece is as we look at the interconnection is the true opportunity cost of doing business 
Mm-hmm. As a woman doing business, what is the true cost of doing business with me? Mm-hmm. For me, right? I'm thinking about, you know, am I choosing a job that is compromising my spiritual beliefs and values? Mm-hmm. And Which we what, tend to, uh, I, I feel like we tend to have um, a more difficult time with that than our male counterparts, yes. at least in my experience in the business. I, you know, it's, I have made so many of my own career decisions because if I enter into that project with those people, then I feel as if I have to put on a front or Mm -hmm. I have to check some values at the door, which means now I'm living inauthentically and I, I can't perform well in that space. I, we, we work in the story spaces and I can't create well if I'm styming who I am. And so, but then there's that fear, right. Of, especially if you're the breadwinner, if I don't say yes to this, now am I not going to feed my kids? What's going to happen? You know, it's, it's yes, just... all of those things, all of those things. Those are the stories. Women who are listening, those are the stories. We want to mm-hmm. we want to hear your stories of how you're doing it, how you're making it happen, yeah. um, the ways that it worked and the ways that it didn't. Yeah, I think it's just as powerful to see the ways that it didn't. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't want to in any way communicate the message that you have to be killing it right now for us to be interested. I mean, if you tried and colossally failed, actually, this is funny, not funny. This is <laughs> wrong word, wrong descriptor. Uh, this is appropriate. So I used to write for founder magazine. I did CEO profiles for founder founders, like fast company and mm-hmm, Forbes mm-hmm. business magazine. And um, I did an article for, so, so founder does not allow you to pitch articles. They do not take outside pitches for articles. All of the content ideas are generated within. And mm-hmm. then you are assigned as a writer. This is what you're writing about. This is who you're writing about. Here's the interview, whatever. But one time I had a colossal career failure. Mm. It was, I mean, it was, it was a go big or go home explosion. (laughs) And so I went to my editor after months later, after I had, you know, sifted through it for the lessons that were there and, and started anew and things like that. And I went to her and I said, I'm not seeing in our magazine stories of failure, but there are lessons to be learned here. Would you mind me writing an article about this? And so she took it to the powers that be and they said, yeah, okay. You know, well, she's been with us for a while. We'll let her do the article. So the article came out and uh, fast forward to just a few weeks ago. So this article came out several years ago, Mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago. I happened to remember that on in Facebook messenger, there's a section in those messages for people who aren't connected to you. If they try to message you, it'll go over there. Yes. And I don't ever look there, mm-hmm. but I was like, Oh, I haven't looked there in a long time. I should see if there are any messages there. And there was a message from a woman that was two years old. She had read that article after having a career failure. And she was like, I was ready to f- end life. I was ready to just be done with everything. I was never going to come back from this. I had failed. I had tried. I'd gone big. And it failed and I was done. And she said, but then I read your article. And so I've decided, you know, lick my wounds a little bit and I'm going to try again and find the lessons that there are to find in this failure. And I read it. It was so satisfying because I was like, was it fun to put it out there to 2.1 million readers that I massively fit? Right. No, right. but like, that's the reality. Part of entrepreneur life, I, I can only really speak to entrepreneur life because I haven't worked for a corporation for a long time, but Part of the life, as as much a part of success, as much that success is a part of this life, mm-hmm. so is failure. It's a legitimate yes. part of the journey. Yes. And if we're not going to talk about that part, then we can't find the lessons in that part. So we're just going to keep making those same kinds of failures. So I want those books too. I don't know about you, but I, I want the ones that include I, that. <laughs> I need the books of failing forward, right? Failing yes. flat. And failing forward because there's sometimes that we, we, I mean, we fail and then we get in our girlfriend group chats and we yeah. will, right? And we, <laughs> we will, yes, we, we will have well. that failure. That's what I want, right? Like what was, what was the failure? What was the wailing like? And then what was the other side of it? Or if you are still trying to figure out what the other side, what does that process look like of figuring out what happens next now that this has blown up? Right. Mm-hmm. What is what is the talk track that you walk yourself through to mm-hmm. say, ah, oh, yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> Let's not ever do that again. <laughs> but after you say that was terrible, what's the what's the next line of that script? Right. Mm-hmm. Of that internal script 
And then what is the action that motivates, that is motivated from there moving yeah. forward? I love yeah. this. I feel like helping to create that body of knowledge where we can help each other rise in the yes. workforce. It just, yeah, it makes me grin. <laughs> Let's do it, wise women. Let's do Let's it. Do it. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's do it. It's that whole, um, what's the, it's my favorite line in um, Run the World and the Beyonce song, Run the World. She says, strong enough to bear the children, then get back to business. It's my favorite get line. Back to in the business. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Because that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not even going to go down that rabbit hole, but that's a right? true thing. <laughs> that's that's a true thing. It's what we do. We all, if you're in business and you have kids, most of us right now are just having to figure it out in the moment. And mm -hmm. to me, the sad part is that so many of us have figured it out that we, sh that, uh, that we shouldn't, the new ones coming up shouldn't have to be figuring it out for themselves without any knowledge to draw sure. from. You know, sure. absolutely. I was talking with a friend about that yesterday. Her daughter's four months old. She returned to work part time and it's tearing her up. Mm -hmm. And I finally looked at her yesterday and I said, it's OK to be upset about being back at work. Right. She just needed the permission to be upset. And she <laughs> dropped a couple of tears and was just like, OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. and that's all she needed was someone to acknowledge. It is hard being here. Like it is, it is hard. It's heart wrenching. And that's, I said, forget all your emotions being all over the place. Like that's a whole nother set of things. I want to give you permission to acknowledge that this is hard. This sucks in this moment. And yep. that's okay. Yep. And I think that that gave her. So if we can put out books that say that, that it's okay to be like this part of life sucks this or part this part of business sucks or whatever it is, <laughs> yep. then the wisdom will be shared, right? The wisdom will come. Through us yeah. giving permission yeah. to be real. That that permission to be real. That's the that's the thing, is we're held to such a male standard and it's so different, such a different experience career-wise, mm -hmm. professionally, for females. And if we don't give ourselves that permission to be female at work, it is okay. It's not going to look like your male counterpart most okay. often. Yeah. Um, but there's a reason that businesses that have women in leadership, in the leadership team, outperform businesses with only males. We yes. do it well. We just have to give ourselves permission to do it the way that we do it. I love permission that you gave her that permission. Be sad, be upset. It's, it's normal. It's natural. It's, it's totally okay. All of those things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, wouldn't it be, um, wouldn't it be interesting in a sad way if you were a mom who was like, let me just toss my kid off and go back to business. Mm -hmm. I think we all have some, do, some sort of reaction to that when we have to do it. We do. We have, <laughs> we just gave we have very human. visceral reactions to that. Mm -hmm. Yet that is also what's expected of our male counterparts, our male mm -hmm. counterparts are expected to be present for us during this childbirth experience or whatever it is. But then we expect them to also just be like, just, all right, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> have a big day, right? <laughs> and yes. Interesting on so many levels. Yeah. In my own house, um, it was an interesting experience in that, you know, I was in corporate life, I was working for Thomas Nelson, which is Harper Collins, when I got pregnant with my first one. And I knew that I, I put in a ton of hours in my work. And I knew that I just mentally, I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to be up here at this for 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week with a baby at home. I don't think mentally I'm going to be able to separate. So I went to my boss. We tried doing active flex time policy. She had been trying to do it for years before me for her own children, her own situation. Mm -hmm. And it just was never going to happen at that company at that time. And she let me know pretty early on, we'll make another run at it, but you know, males are in charge and they don't see a need for this. And so mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to be able to get the flex time policy. We need to get another situation in place for you. And that's when I left to start my own PR firm and it worked out really well for me, but when I started the firm, my husband was our primary breadwinner with his nice six figure income for his big fortune 500 company he worked for. And just a, a few weeks after I gave birth, he was laid off. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so I was like, what have I done? What have I done? I yes. don't no longer work for the corporation and I have a brand new business and a brand new baby. And I yes. wasn't, and I, we had great benefits through his work and what am I going to do? And, um, he, he spent, he was given a severance package. Thank goodness. It was 12 week severance package. And so for all of those weeks of the severance package, he would send his resume. And this was, this was at a year when the economy was doing very well. There was no reason to think that someone in his field with his track record would have any difficulty finding another job. We were living in Nashville at the time, lots of companies to choose from. This man week to week would start sending resumes further and further out. He got to the point where he was sending resumes to companies on the other side of the country. Yeah. Just trying to find something. He would go in, he went in for an interview and the guy said, in Nashville, the guy said, absolutely, we want you to come work for us. And then as he's exiting in the parking lot, he gets the phone call from that man saying, I've just been put on a hiring freeze, so I can't hire you. So it was like every door was closing for him to stay in the workforce. And I'll never forget the day he turned to me and we were about eight weeks into the 12 week severance package. And he said, do you think I'm supposed to stay at home with our child while you build your business? Mm -hmm. And it was such a radical idea for us, given our upbringings Mm -hmm. for me to be the career and him to be the stay at home. It was, it felt very wrong. It felt very wrong to us. Like we're doing life wrong. Um, And I said, I don't, I don't know. Let's think about that. Let's talk about that because my yes. business was doing well. And then in the 11th week of his 12 week severance, we've always called it the 11th hour. I signed a contract with a client that to the dollar replaced his income. Wow. And he looked at me and he said, I think this is what we're supposed to do. I'm supposed to stay at home and take care of him. We had a son uh, and you work, you, you build your business and I'll mm-hmm. help you because he's an IT guy. And so he was able to handle the mm-hmm. IT, which I since now know was a massive value to my company yes. to yes. have a cybersecurity guy um, right there, you know, yes. <laughs> and right yes. there with me. Um, and he, so he stayed home for the first three and a half years of our son's life. He stayed home and raised our son. He was the primary caregiver while I was the primary breadwinner. And it, he and my son are ridiculously close today. In ways that I don't see other dads and sons, they just bonded so hard. I mean, not that I didn't bond with my son. My, I'm very close. I'm freakishly close with both my children. It's very Gilmore girls up in here, but um, I, I credit that with, he was home with our kiddo for the first three and a half years of his life. Every time that child needed anything, his dad was there, mm-hmm. but having that experience, when I talk with that about other women, they're like, First of all, being married to a man that would consider it was a gift. You know, yes. nobody even considers staying home. Yes. But then yes. second, what does that look like? How does that function, you know, in, in your everyday life when it's the woman who's working and the man who's staying home? Those are the kinds of stories that I I would love to put out there in the world because there was we had a lot of cultural pushback. And we of still course. do it to this day. Of um, course. That's a story that Rebecca it. Books wants. Uh, yes. That that particular story. We're not right. I'm not writing that story. <laughs> we're, we're not publishing any of my stuff through this company, but <laughs> it is not a vanity press. But normalizing those kinds of situations yes, and those absolutely. kinds of decisions I, is very important. I think to the health of this society, yes. we have to normalize those kinds of decisions and those kinds of situations. Or yes. I don't think we're going to make it. We have to acknowledge that that is just as valid as yes. it would have been for us to move for him to go work somewhere else and me to stay at home, that both are just as valid. Yes. So that's my little soapbox for the day. That was it. That was my, <laughs> it was a good one. It was a motivational one. I'm going to, I have, I have some friends now. She's the primary breadwinner. He's the, the, the stay at home dad with some mm-hmm. flexibility and stuff. And so now I'm curious about, I've always well, been curious, but now I'm I'm more curious about what that decision making process was like for her, mm-hmm. right? Because and just like you said, we have this response to, oh, I'm going. Yes, and yeah. it it impacts your your relationship at home too. Yes, um, because he's getting pushback from his buddies. Of, oh, yeah. oh, you're a kept man now, and now you're, and so it's there's so much. There are just layers and layers of impact that happen. And that's just yeah. one way that our business adventures can look different from our male counterparts, you know, and Indeed. I just, we've got to normalize our experiences and we're going to do that. Right. Right. Here. Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> if we do nothing else that we will do that we will do. <laughs> okay. So I've kept you on here in 
I told her, everybody, I told her that this would be just a 15 or 20 minute thing. And, and we're, this is definitely twice that. So um, let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this up. Is there anything that you definitely want people to know about you, about your involvement with Rebecca Books, about what you're looking for or how to work with you or on any of those fronts, something you definitely want to say to them? Not that you won't be coming back on. I'm just saying. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm going to take this time, right? Opportunity (laughs) is here. It may or may not, not twice. I'm going to take it. Mm. The one thing that I want to say about working with me, about working with Rebecca Books, is that I want you to be courageous. Mm. I want you to be courageous enough to write stories that we haven't seen to build characters that we haven't met, having experiences that are very real to us. And I want you to be courageous to share your journey in business, your journeys in business, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. This is a collective of wisdom. We are making a rue. Keep Mm -hmm. adding to it. We're going to keep adding to it. And it only becomes as tasteful and as flavorful as the ingredients that we put in. So Mm -hmm. wise women write, write on, write on, write on with courage. And this is a safe space. This is a safe space. (laughs) This is a safe space. Yeah. Um. That brings to mind, I haven't told everybody yet, you know, our, our future intentions to bring everybody together once a year, our content creators together once a year. We used to do that in one of my other businesses where I managed artists and Mm -hmm. it was such an incredible time of sort of being able to let down the walls that we have to put up to keep ourselves safe out there as creators and just be our authentic selves with each other. Oh, it was such a good time. Uh, it was such a good time to do those. And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that with content creators here at Rebecca books too. Same. Fun. Okay. Well, if you guys want to get in touch with Danielle, it is Danielle at Rebecca books.com. And if you don't know how to spell Rebecca by now, it won't go to her. So <laughs> it will not. it's only got one C <laughs> one C and it gets to me. That's it. And it gets to you one C and it gets to me. I like that. <laughs> And if you want to see what needs to be in your proposal, go to RebeccaBooks.com, scroll down. The five elements that need to be in your proposal are listed and described there. You do not have to be represented by an agency or an agent to be considered here. Not right now, anyway. We'll see. We shall see. That's where we are today, is that you can query us directly if you are a writer. And we would love to hear from you, right? And by we, I mean her. Don't worry, Rebecca's gonna see them too. These weekly editorial review meetings. That's true. That's she, true. She's gonna have to see them. I'll just get to say, oh, this is the juicy one to bump to the top of the pile. That's true. Make That's yours true. the juicy one. That is true. Make yours the juicy one. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know you're busy and you have a million things going on. So I appreciate you taking time out from all that to let everybody meet you here on the I podcast. appreciate you and this opportunity. This has been fun. We should do this again sometime. We should. We should do we it. We should like work together on something. I don't know. We should get together. <laughs> <laughs> work on something together. You have such good ideas, Daniel. Oh, you have such great ideas. You feel so great. Like this. Da, 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 da. We're like a little dance duo or something. It's real sad how serious we are in this company. It's just oh, so boring. Anyway. Such a serious place. Buttoned up. <laughs> okay, if you guys have questions. For the record, oh, guys, I do have on a jacket with buttons on it. It's a cool jacket. For the record, I don't. <laughs> So I am technically buttoned up. (laughs) Which makes one of us. And really, it should be at least one of us, right? Should be (sighs) professional and buttoned up. I think it should be you. (laughs) Mm, mm, That can be mm. you. Every time. That can be you. Okay, every time. That's it. It's happening. (laughs) We're in trouble if we have to be serious all the time. Yeah. Yeah. uh, That's not going to work. But we will be serious about getting your book out there to the market because that's important. That That's is true. That has to happen that is, is that true. your stories have to be told. Yes. They have to be shared. And made available. You know, I'm so, I, I've said, mentioned before, I'll mention it one more time and then I'll hush, is that the, the key element I needed to know that I could make a traditional royalty paying publishing house work 
was having a contractual relationship with a distribution company that could get my books in Walmart and Target and Costco yes. and Sam's and airport bookstores and Barnes and Noble and all of those places. Yes. So when we signed our contract with APG, I was like, okay, this, this will this happen. Our books will be available. All of these women's voices will yes. be made available yes. all over the place. So over let's do this. Yeah. Wisdom. Yeah. Wisdom. Wisdom out there. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Thanks for taking the time. No, thank you. I hope you are as thrilled as I am that Danielle is on the Rebecca Books team. She's a truly lovely, wise soul, and it's an honor to have her aboard. Thanks for listening and being a part of this incredible journey to build a traditional, royalty-paying publishing house that honors women 40 and over by making space for their voices and compensating them well. If you want to submit a project for consideration, Check out the show notes to get the spelling for Danielle's email address. It's danielle at rebeccabooks.com. Until next week. You've been listening to Raising Rebecca Books, the birth of a publishing house from the 1C Story Network. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and learn more at rebeccabooks.com. That's R-E-B-E-C-A books.com. Network for the love of stories.